Joining us is a man who is no stranger, of course, to the Observer. I want to thank him and welcome him once again for taking time out of his busy schedule. Uh, Oropooch MP and Shadow Minister of Housing, Works and Transport and National Security, Dr. Rudal Munilal. Pleasant good evening to you, Doc. Good evening, Mikey, and to all those in the studio, and to all your viewers, a uh, pleasant uh, good evening, and thank you so much for your kind invitation to be on your show. Always a pleasure to have you on, always insightful and always giving us that clarity that we seem to lack when it comes to mainstream media and what's coming out of the thank administration. Thank you, thank you so on. much. You, you made it quite clear recently that the country is ungovernable under the current administration, and you said that critical institutions have collapsed. Please expand on that. Well, as I've said uh, in the last uh, press conference, I believe it was, that um, this country today is ungovernable. Uh, the government has lost control of the critical sectors, uh, particularly security, uh, poverty, social development, uh, housing, uh, education, health, and so on. Uh, the, the country is on remote control, uh, and this is under the weight. This has happened because of the weight of corruption and mismanagement and waste that we see before us. And I gave several examples of this, but I think the most critical example now is that uh, the country has collapsed in terms of managing uh, security and criminality and so on, where I think the government has just given up, and we are seeing every day um, horrible manifestations of their their defeat in terms of dealing with crime and security. Now, as far as getting that message across uh, to the average citizen, I mean, many believe that, you know, upon hearing this, that we have gone so far that anyone taking over the reins would have it so difficult and challenging. There's no magic wand to put things in place. But the history of all of this did not take place overnight. I mean, you have a prime minister who made it clear in opposition that he sent the, the now national security minister to Fairfax County in Virginia. And I keep bringing that up because we were told as citizens that coming into government, they had done their homework. They knew exactly what had to be done, what needed to be implemented. There was so much legislation when they came in, of course. We were told that they know where the gangsters are sleeping, if they order a, a center breast with fries, which woman they with. We were told all of that. But today, when we see news reports about people mowing their grass, and they're being held up in their yard while exercising and taking away their, their brush cutter and lawnmower. We ask then just how much more or how further can we go with this issue? Well, it is, it is, it is as dastardly as you describe. Um, they had all the answers while in opposition because they were in the business of propaganda. I've always said that the PNM is really a grade A political party as far as it relates to propaganda. And um, they convinced some people, I guess, that they had the solutions. And when they, they arrived in government, they were hopeless. And part of it has to do that they, they lack human capital, they lack capacity, they lack competence, they lack efficiency. So you have a cabinet that, by and large, I mean, it's difficult to name one outstanding high-performance minister in any sector, whether you look at works, you look at security, you look at health education and so on. So... These are the issues they face. I mean, it's just incompetence down the line. And Keith Rowley, is, is, you know, has always been described as lazy, as visionless, as, you know, I, I coin a term to describe him. He's not just arrogant, he's ignorant. And, um, you know, that has defined his tenure in office. And they cannot solve any problem that this country faces because of sheer incompetence, um, corruption, mismanagement, and waste. And that is something that the country has to understand. Nothing will change. I mean, while we, we wish everybody Happy New Year and so on, really nothing will change in the new year. You will continue to get this situation of, um, of high crime, of poverty, of joblessness and so on, because they are hopeless. Yeah, I, I want you to stress on that issue as far as 2024. I mean, uh, going into the new year, as we are showing a brand new year, and we already see the figures here that are totally ridiculous as far as the crime figures. Um, with no plan, with no sense of understanding how the criminals are working, the, the former commissioner of police, Mr. Jacob, made it quite clear that he's never interacted with this different style or, or different sort of uh, criminal, which seems not to care, which seems not to have any sort of, uh, you know, compassion for those victims that are out there. And as we move into a brand new year, what can we expect as citizens? 
Well, I mean, regrettably, we have to expect that the situation will get worse. But coming now back to an earlier point you made, Mike, is that, listen, once you have competent men and women, you have clear policy, you have what I call political drivers, persons who can drive policy to action, uh, you, can, you can address this situation. Um, clearly, we cannot change the, the situation overnight, the problems with the economy in particular. You can't change that overnight, but surely within three months, six months, one year, you should see progress in reducing crime. You should, should see progress in creating jobs. Uh, you should see progress, you know, in dealing with poverty. Uh, you know, putting some improvements in health in particular. Um, you know, it, you should see improvements within a year under UNC administration. I, I mean, I can say that with confidence because we have the competence. You know, managing a country requires competence. And if you don't have competence, then I'm sorry, every, every system, every institution will collapse. Yeah, uh, even when you look at the fact that we've seen news reports where uh, individuals have been robbed by people in police uniform or what have you, and you said that you called on National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines to conduct an audit of the various arms of law enforcement as there's a need to evaluate the procurement as well of uniforms and the companies that correct, supply correct. them and the revision of policy and laws. I one would think that this would be somewhat, uh, you know, quite understandable that anybody dealing with this situation that we currently have in this country would make sure that there's no stone unturned and to deal with all of these factors. Why? Why does it seem as though there's a sort of a, a, a dragging feet, uh, you know? But as I said, here. I mean, you're dealing with Fitzgerald Hines, who, you know, when mo half the time he's asleep and the next half of the time he's half awake. And um, even when he's awake, his mind is asleep. So, you know, he, he have been told, I think, the, the public relations persons around the government have told him to remain quiet and hide. And then he may appear that he's doing a good job if he hides. So I think that is his strategy, is just hiding from the problem. Um, they are, you know, a minister of national security ought to be proactive, ought to be on the front line, ought to be you know, but working by the hour almost with the law enforcement community to ensure that they have the resources, the equipment, the, uh, you know, the material and human uh, resources and so on. And uh, he clearly has slept away. I mean, I, I tell people and uh, I tell people the truth. I mean, the police contact some of us in opposition to, you know, to help them to buy printers and help them to buy, buy ink and paper and pen and so on. That's where we have reached. And the government, as I say, is a bystander to the crisis that we face. This is why I, I have said before, Mikey, that the PNM is the opposition in waiting. They are just waiting to demit office as soon as the yeah. general elections is called. Yeah. And, and, and I want to touch on the issue of cybersecurity. I mean, sure. there are reports, of course, from the TSTT since the company's mega cyber attack in October. There's sure. been a deafening silence. Uh, read today where the former, I believe, Lisa Agard is pursuing uh, legal action, perhaps a full dismissal. Uh, all of that now has been tied up. And again, the minds of these criminal minds are evolving uh, and they're, they're looking for anything that is vulnerable that they can take full advantage well, of. What has happened is I, I have called and I've indicated that we must establish a cybersecurity national center that brings together a multi uh, multi-departmental task force to work across law enforcement, including working with the private sector, with academics, university experts, and so on, to, to get our hands on this problem of cybercrime and cybersecurity. It is a very sophisticated and relatively new uh, feature of international crime. Uh, it, it is not, you know, narco trafficking, human trafficking, and so on, and drugs, and so on, that we knew about for decades. This is a new feature of transnational crime. And we need to get the institution in place to deal with it and the experts in place to deal with it so that we can prevent uh, cyber attacks and so on, but also when it happens so that we can respond in real time to ensure that data that can be used by criminal elements and so on uh, don't get in their hands. And I have called for the establishment of a, a cybersecurity national agency akin to the model that we already um, know which is the, the English model, which has been in place since 2007. Yeah. But, but, but one would also think to expand on that and call in, of course, the financial institutions, all the stakeholders, because, I mean, 
identity theft is very easy to come about, but it's difficult when you have to repair all the damage that has been done by criminals who would have taken your identity and perhaps run up your credit and all of that. Uh, you know, well, and, and this day on HR, Mikey, don't forget that a person's got to hack into systems and take uh, security information, right. information concerning your security systems, your alarms and your house, your alarm and security systems at the place of work and so on. They can take that, and then that makes for easy robbery and home invasion and so on. Yeah, yeah and, and, and compounded with the fact that we don't know where this information is on the dark web. And, and I'm sure that in some time in the near future, you're going to hear reports about that. And how does the government intend to deal with it when individuals are saying, listen, uh, my grandmother's pension, whatever, whatever came through the system has affected us as consumers and citizens. What is in place to deal with this when it arises? Sure. And, and this is why we need to have an extra effort in restructuring national security to deal with cybercrime, which will be with us for a long time to come, because whether we like it or not, we, we, we will uh, live in a digital future in which, you know, we will function in an environment where everything around us, our home, our place of work, our recreation, everything will be determined by digital technology. So therefore, cybersecurity is really a threat uh, for our lifetime and the lifetimes to come. And this is why I've asked for special institutional development uh, as it relates to this particular, uh, you know, breed of international and transnational crime. Yeah, and one would think that they would really put something in place. Uh, so far, we've gotten no update on Anthony Michael Smith. Uh, and you spoke about this in Lent uh, as far as no update on this convicted human trafficker who went missing before his trial uh, somewhere around and, September 24th. And that 24th. Mikey, is, rooted, is rooted in certain facts in that the Ministry of National Security procured uh, equipment that was defective, uh, equipment that were inferior. So they procured inferior um, ankle bracelets, uh, electronic monitoring devices that were inferior. It means that your pet poodle or pet cat or something could bite it off. And, and then, you know, you, you, you can roam around the place and, and flee as this particular individual who is now convicted has fled uh, not just the law enforcement, but possibly the jurisdiction as well. Uh, because the government of this country, national security in particular, procured equipment that was inferior and defective. Uh, uh, looking at what you spoke about as far as wastage and corruption, uh, Eureka Chairman Noel Garcia made it quite clear that Skinner Park, of course in San Fernando, I want to say good evening to the people in San Fernando, because they now have an international center which is designed for a blend of cultural and sporting activities but not intended for international games. Uh, and you're saying for a, hundred, a bill of $147 million, sure. did we get value for our money? Well, I mean, we, we have a feel in Skinner Park now that has to be used for FETs and for small goal. I think it's essentially small goal they can play there um, because the, the, the field has been moved and changed. Um, they spent $147 million plus dollars there. They made this, the field smaller. And Skinner Park, which has been a mecca of international sport and even secondary school, I mean, is a mecca of intercol and secondary school football, it cannot host an adult match. Yeah, but why make it smaller? When we asked why, they said they moved the pavilion. So they put the pavilion in the wrong place, had to make the field smaller. They said the football, they said the football um, people complained that the goalkeepers, the sun were in their eyes. Now you can't play football at all. So there's no issue of sun in your eyes. But everybody knows in football, the goalkeepers wear a cap if, if and when sun is in their eye, which will only be for 45 minutes or half of a match. Um, so that was, that was, to me, idiotic. And what is more important is that $147 million have gone, and they built really two pavilions with that money. Yeah, and then to talk about the fact that it's now international standard. I, I mean, we've, we've seen where big sponsors, big Fortune 500 companies are now partnering with cities to build stadiums, and these are mega stadiums. Uh, so no, when you say international you cannot standard... Play international, in fact, that, they, they, they played a girls on the 15 football match. 11 players started and 9 players had it reduced to 9 players by the end because 22 players cannot run on the field. Yeah. 
Uh, and yet still, it costs us $147 million. And counting, I keep saying the word and counting, because every year, and every finance bill that comes, for what is called um, variation and appropriation, they're asking for more money to pay outstanding bills. So it's $147 million now, but that will go to $160, $170, 180 by the time we are finished. Yeah, it really makes you wonder. Uh, also on the Essequibo issue, I mean, you spoke about the Essequibo issue. Uh, of course, as we have the Prime Minister who is scheduled to go in on Thursday uh, for well, which that is a meeting. Paper, which really is the ultimate act of hypocrisy, because Dr. Rowley accused the UNC's leader, uh, you know, of intervening and being um, out of place to speak of medi mediation and to speak of meeting bilaterally and so on. And here he is going to what is essentially a bilateral meeting between Venezuela and Guyana. So that is the ultimate act of hypocrisy that he will go there. But, but let me ask you this, Dr. Munilal. As far as the treaty that was Article 9, that was updated, I believe, in December 31st, 2016, in the areas of cooperation, why is it that we're not discussing that? Well, the, the government apparently don't know the treaty, the security treaty, and what is called the Regional Security System Agreement, but that binds our countries to defend each other, even with arms, when one country is under the threat, when they, ex when they are under threat of what is called their territorial integrity, meaning invasion and so on. But as I've said in my press conference, Dr. Rowley is weak on crime, he's weak. He has said absolutely nothing about home invasion in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a major issue. And what Maduro is doing there is really international home invasion. He's leaving his house and going into somebody else's house and invading. So that is international home invasion. And Dr. Rowley is silent on this matter because he's essentially weak on, on crime. Yeah, I, I know you spoke about sometime as well of the British firm that was paid a lump sum of money and perhaps uh, still waiting for it to be paid out, which was nothing more than a political witch hunt that is being funded by the taxpayers of this country. The taxpayers have paid $45 million so far to a British private prosecution team to come down to Trinidad to ostensibly work to target, to target former People's Partnership ministers, including myself. And they have paid $45 million plus. Eight years later, they have absolutely nothing to show for it. And I want to tell you one time, uh, Mikey, that an incoming UNC government will investigate that. And we will call whoever had took decisions to pay $45 million to this British private prosecution team. We will call them to account. And we may even garnish their pension and gratuity to pay those bills. Yeah. Uh, and on a personal note, Dr. Munida, you know, what, what basically motivates you? And we have a, a large regional audience uh, in Guyana, Grenada, and so forth. Well, I mean, so let me say hello to all of our great friends and supporters in Grenada, yes. in St. Kitts, in Antigua, in Guyana, etc. I mean, I have enormous fans myself <laughs> in those countries. Uh, I want to say good night to all of them. Yes. Um, well, uh, at my stage, Mikey, I've spent, I've spent my entire adult life in public service. Uh, I have been a child of the United National Congress. Um, you know, you are motivated by service. You are motivated by, you know, the the intangible rewards of service. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, you're motivated that, uh, you know, God has ordained that your your role on earth is really to help others and to ensure other people are happy, other people are well taken care of, other people have experience opportunity prosperity i mean i still have people who come to me you know regularly to thank me for providing them with a home a roof over their head um so you get that kind of satisfaction and uh, as i say service is in my blood so as we, as a former leader said long time ago i've i've come too far to turn back now yeah i, I mean you you seem to be viewed as uh, political enemy number one when it comes to uh, the current administration, uh, standing up there, I mean, debating, talking about the issues. Uh, it, it makes you wonder, those of us who are looking on as to, I mean, just how much can you endure? How, how broad is your back, I should say? Well, <laughs> I, I, can carry, I can carry this struggle on my not too slender shoulders. And um, as I've said before, 
uh, God is great. Um, he will never put a burden on your back that you can't carry. And uh, I've had enormous support from friends and family and well-wishers. And I've, I, I enjoy the love of a lot of people um, in my line of work. And, you know, just, you know, a few hours ago, I was in the company of constituents and so on. And when you feel their love and somebody come up to you and just shake your hand and say, thank, thank, thank you for your service. Thank you for doing the great job you're doing. You feel good, and that inspires you, and that allows me to carry on. And as I've said before, I mean, my, my journey continues, and um, as long as the people will... Will accept you, I guess. Uh, are you there? Oh. Yeah. And, and final question. I mean, you have made it quite clear that the UNC has one political leader at this time, and uh, you stand with that political leader. I'm, I'm not hearing you, Mikey. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes, I'm hearing you better now. Yeah, you've made it quite clear as well, uh, even as in the capacity of deputy political leader, that the UNC has one political leader at this time, and you stand with the political leader. But I'm very clear that we have one leader, one party, one vision. Uh, Mrs. Passat Bissessa has given great leadership to the party and the country, and uh, we support her 100%. Uh, she has enormous uh, capacity um, for leadership, and her compassion is now legendary. Uh, and we support her, and we will work uh, together as a team in our party to ensure that we remove uh, this dictatorship and this devil called the PNM. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking time. Thank you very much, up. Mikey, and all the best to your listeners in trying to be gone across the Caribbean, the region, and the wider hemisphere. Same Good night you as well. bless you all. Have a wonderful season and keep up the good work. Best of luck to you and your Thank entire you team. Thank you so much. Yeah.